Hello, I'm Dr. Ward Dean, Medical Director for Vitamin Research Products. The first international anti-aging conference, which was sponsored jointly by Vitamin Research and International Anti-Aging Systems, was held on June 17th and 18th, 2000, in Monte Carlo, Monaco. The conference attracted scientists, clinicians, and anti-aging enthusiasts from around the world. These tapes offer an opportunity to listen to the wealth of information that was presented. For those who were unable to attend the conference, it offers a hint of the experience that they missed. Please join me as I listen to one of the speakers at this breakthrough conference. I cordially invite you to join us at the next conference in Monaco next year, which promises to offer a similar roster of international specialists in anti-aging medicine. Our first speaker this morning is one of only 200 physicians worldwide who is board eligible in the field of anti-aging medicine. He is a strong advocate of the pursuit of this ultimate form of preventative medicine, which is made clear by his professional memberships in the Society of Orthomolecular Medicine, the American College for the Advancement of Medicine, and the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. Having actively practiced anti-aging medicine in his Nevada clinic for over 15 years, he brings us a wealth of practical experience. Please welcome Dr. Frank Schallenberger. Good morning. Glad to have you here. And also, special thanks to Phil and James from IAS for not only putting on the conference, but for the great job that you guys do helping out my patients. And also to uh, Rob and VRP and the rest of the group with VRP, and especially you folks for being here. Um, I'm going to kind of go through this morning how you can actually do this, how you actually set up your clinic, how you actually see patients and, and make this work. Okay. What is anti-aging medicine? It's not anti-death medicine. You're going to die. It's anti-aging medicine. It's stopping the aging process. And yesterday there was a question about, do you think we can stop the aging process? And the fact is we're stopping it right now. This is a, very much of an evolving field. So what I'm going to tell you today is going to be different in a year. It might be different in six months. For that reason, I'm going to focus mostly on, on conceptual ideas, sort of a, a framework kind of position on how to set things up. Because down the line, new technologies and things are always emerging that you're going to pull some out. But this will give you a framework and a setup on how to approach your patient and the, the kinds of technology you want to be interested in. Anti-aging medicine is to help our patients grow old. We want to have a really, really old, old group of patients. And we want them to feel young. And so if you focus on that, how do you measure feeling young? Then you'll start to begin to see what you're going to do to get people to feel that way. There's a couple of things that, when I first got into this field, stood out an awful lot. The first thing is that not everybody wants to get involved in this. I would say most people don't really enjoy living, don't really want to get old anyway. They just as soon die. So I don't think that this is going to be a big problem for the public authorities, you know, having everybody live long. And the majority of people that you will talk to, and this will probably change over time, hopefully, just are not all that interested in. So don't be surprised if you start talking to your patients about this and you find that there's not a huge interest in how can I live better, how can I live longer. Uh, another thing now, there's basically four things that I want you to understand that are different about this specialty than about pretty much any other aspect of conventional medicine. The first is that it's very proactive. You don't wait until you're having the symptoms of aging to begin an anti-aging program. You begin before you have the symptoms. We all start to age somewhere around the age of 30, 35. We start going to that downward thing. But most of us don't really feel it until we hit the late 40s, early 50s. That's not the time to start this. So that's the first thing I want you to think of, is, is talking to your patients and getting them to understand that the time to start this is before they even feel any symptoms at all. 
The second thing is that this is a, an individualizing process. Every therapy is completely geared towards the individual because people are so different. So we've got to have ways of identifying what characteristics of what individual need to be treated? Because you're not going to give everybody vitamin C. You're not going to give everybody a special, your, your super diet. Everything has to be individualized, so how are you going to do that? Uh, are you just going to like do it and see what happens, and if it doesn't work 20 years later, you say, yeah, I'm wrong. I was wrong. No, you've got to have ways to uh, assess each individual. Uh, this field is a new field. It's very emergent, it's very new. Uh, not many physicians know about it, much, much less lay people. Uh, they need a lot of education, they need a lot, a lot of help. When they go to, in to see their cardiologist, they're gonna know a whole lot of what to expect. But when they come in to see you for anti-aging, they're not really gonna know much of what you're doing, what you're testing, what, they probably don't even know what anti-aging is. So we need a lot of patient education. In our clinic, we do a lot of education. In fact, I have a book about a half an inch thick that they have to read before they even see me because otherwise I sit there and spend too much time answering questions. So patient education is a different thing than conventional medicine. We need to get more patient education so the patients understand what we're about to do. The last and I think the most significant thing that you need to get involved in this field. And the one I'm gonna spend basically all the talk on is how to measure. You know, in conventional medicine, basically, we diagnose whether you're sick or you're not sick. And uh, we base our therapy on that. If you're sick, you get a therapy. If you're not sick, you don't get a therapy. This is a different thing. Nobody's sick, necessarily. So our conventional tests, our conventional measurements are essentially useless. Because we're in the not sick category and we're trying to figure out where they stand in that category. So we have to have special ways to measure. And I think measuring the aging process and being individualized our patients is the most important thing that we have to do in this field. By measuring, we'll know when to initiate something. Is it time to give vitamin C? And by measuring, we know if it's in fact working. If I'm putting somebody on an anti-aging program, I'd like to know if, in fact, I'm really stopping the aging process. So you have to think about that. Now, the way I do this now is maybe different than I'll do it in a year, but currently, right now, I look at mitochondrial function, and that's sort of like the baseline for me. If I can get my patients to have a, a healthy, optimal, youthful mitochondrial function, then I figure I've stopped the aging process with them. That may be different a year from now. Maybe something else I'm looking at. I'm not quite sure. But, so, but think in terms of that. Think in terms of finding ways to measure youthfulness. OK, a couple things about measuring the aging process. First of all, these so-called normal ranges, and I don't like the word normal, because they're not normal. They're just statistical ranges, are essentially useless for this field. So when you get a serum testosterone level and it's, quote, normal, it's in the statistical range, that in this field essentially means nothing. The next best thing to get, other than measuring functional assessment, is baselines. So think in terms of baselines. Try and get your patients in to see you when they're 35, 40, and do every test you can possibly think on them. Most of them are going to be normal. You're going to find a few that may be out of whack, but most of those tests are going to be in the statistical range. However, you can use that 20 years later. You can use the cholesterol level. It's a great baseline test. Use it 20 years later, and now you know what they were when they were young, and you've got something to gauge against. Because if you don't have a baseline, you can't compare back to where the, what they were. You've got to compare back to some mythical statistical patient out there. The best way to assess aging is to do a functional assessment. And that's what we'll spend the rest of the time talking about, is how do you do that? What functions are we looking at, and how do you test the function of a patient? We need to measure and maintain function. This talk will talk about the measuring part. The, our other speakers are talking more about the uh, treating part. This is about the measuring part. 
measure and maintain function, measuring and treating the factors that affect function, and measuring and decreasing disease risk factors. There's no good if our patient gets sick and dies of a heart attack and doesn't get a chance for our anti-aging program to work. So these are the three areas that we focus on. Okay, so now we'll get into how do you measure function? What kind of functions are we talking about with the aging process? Well, clearly, there's a lot of brain functions that deteriorate. So we need to find ways to uh, assess mood, sleep, equilibrium, memory, and recall, and reaction time, uh, strength and flexibility. I think this is particularly important to assess metabolism. I think probably the one single aspect of the aging process that pretty much determines everything is how well oxygen is utilized. It's utilized efficiently, that's gonna be good. To the degree that it's not utilized efficiently, you're gonna generate free radicals, you won't make protein, you ruin your DNA, everything sort of stems from that. Endurance, immune function, sexual function, vision, this area is pretty much huge now because as patients get older and older, they're all getting macular degeneration now. This is a huge problem. And we need to look more proactively at measuring visual fields to determine when that macular degeneration begins to start because if you can see that, that's something that you definitely very aggressively can treat early on and prevent. Digestive function, skin and bone integrity, heart and peripheral circulation, and pulmonary function. This is what we do in our clinic. We check out all that stuff. Now that's a whole lot of stuff. We're not missing a lot that I can think of. And this is a pretty comprehensive thing, but in a year it's gonna change, I'm sure. So we'll just take each one as we go along. Certain things, I haven't figured out a way to measure, measure in an objective fashion. So, so for a, a lot, of, lot of our patients, we use a, a questionnaire type of thing. And uh, we use a rated scale. We have the patient fill it out. It's often very helpful to have a family member in there to tattletale on them, because sometimes the men will say their sexual function is just great, and somebody else is over there just shaking their head. And this is the kind of scale we use. And we use this to determine things like bowel function, mood, sleep, memory, things like that. I will tell you this much. When patients are filling out these questionnaires, always ask them to compare their functions to the where it was when it was best. I usually say 25 and 30. Compare your sex life to when it's 25 and 30, because if you don't ask them that, they're gonna say, oh yeah, my sex life is great. And you're gonna say, well, how is it compared to when you were 25 or 30? It's nowhere near like that. So, so, so because they're not thinking in terms of how they are, they're not sick, so they're great. I mean, that's what we've all been trained. If you're not sick, you're great. We got in the, now we're looking at this whole continuum of what it means to be not sick. And that's what we need to do with the questionnaires. This is a, a pretty neat little test. This is like a $35 computer program. I don't know how many of you have, have seen this test. This is where you can get it. And it tests all this stuff. It's very slick. Just put it on your little uh, computer and it'll test your reaction time got some really neat spatial sorts of effects such that lights will light from the left and go to the right. You've got to hit that, and the light from the right and go to the left. You've got to hit a button to indicate that. Then they'll give you like a picture of a dog and the word dog, and you've got to say yes to that. But if they give you the picture of a dog and the word dog with the red line under it, you've got to say no. So this is, it's a pretty good test, and it's, it's hard to do. And there's no way in the world I can even come close to my 19-year-old son. So this would be a good thing to get a baseline on uh, as our patients are in their 25s and 30s. So you, can, you can follow this and check this out. But very clearly, we can see patients that have uh, very, rather slow reaction times. Some, some of the patients can't even literally do the test or remember the directions all that well. It might take them 45 minutes to get through the test and very clearly see a year later that uh, the reaction times are, are hugely improved. Equilibrium. I think equilibrium is a huge area that we need to look at. The, the more I see how people are as they get older, the, the less well they can balance 
and they limit their activities because of this. Frequently, they get uh, vertigo, attacks of vertigo. And so I believe equilibrium is an extremely important thing to measure. Now, there is a $30,000 computerized equilibrium platform, which I would love to have, and I don't have. So uh, what we do is simply just get a two by four. And they've made a little two by four apparatus, and have them walk along a two by four, see how far they can go, heel to toe, before they start to tipsy or fall over. You can do your standard Romberg type of testing, sort of like a, a, a drunk test. We do a one leg stand, which is basically, just watch me fall over, kind of like that. And you just see how long you can stand like that. And you do it for each leg, and what you'll find is going to be a difference. They'll do really well on one side and won't do as well on the other. Hopefully the technology here will get better and better, so we'll get, be able to get a little bit more objective measurement on that. But it is pretty usual to see a noticeable improvement in equilibrium after a year of therapy. A word about equilibrium, too, in terms of treatment, and that, that is to get patients to begin to practice things, so getting them to use their brain and get, exercise that brain. Well, the other is true, too, because a lot of our patients, when their equilibrium's off a little bit, they don't want to go out and ride a bike. They're going to crash. So we need to, you know, maybe tell them, set up a two-by-four, start walking on curbs, start walking heel-to-toe in a straight line, see, and, and beginning to get used to that kind of thing. We have a full-time trainer on our staff, and she does a lot of things. She does a lot of this testing, a lot of the reaction time testing, and then she does strength testing and flexibility testing. Really important to have a trainer, I think, because patients will take pills. Some patients will even come in and get an IV treatment. But to get them to get out there and do some push-ups is, you know, really pushing it now. Uh, to get them to do a little meditation, you're really pushing it. So they need somebody other than the physician that's going to call them back and make sure that they're doing these things. So I think a full-time trainer on your staff to do measurements and to establish exercise programs and to do a little follow-up on that is hugely important. These are the kinds of things that she does to assess strength and flexibility at this time. Grip strength, it's real simple. We pick on grip strength because we're going to put them on, on exercise programs. And what I really want to know is, is my therapy leaving aside the exercise program increasing their strength? And very few of them are going to go out and exercise their grasp. They'll exercise every other muscle, but they won't necessarily exercise their grasp. So it gives you a good objective assessment of what your treatment protocol is doing, leaving aside whether they're exercising or not. Number of squats, quite simply, they just do this. and. How many times can they do that? A sitting toe touch so that they're kind of sitting on the floor and they're seeing how close they can come to touching their toes with their legs flat on the floor, and that's measured. Hip adduction, how far can they do this? And they get nice, real good flexibility. Many of your patients will do that. They don't go any further. Range of motion, of course, which test. Can they move everything in all directions? And then I just mentioned the exercise education. They really need some help on this. They need some help, they need some follow-up so they don't hurt themselves and so they continue on the program. I'm in the process of producing a paper on this. I, I think this is perhaps the, the single hottest thing in, in anti-aging medicine right now. This is a very simple device, gas exchange analyzer. The pulmonologists use this. I don't know if you're familiar with this device. It's been around for a long time. It simply does two things. It measures how much oxygen is consumed, patient breathes into a tube, and measures how much carbon dioxide is put out. Just how much oxygen is going in and how much carbon dioxide is put out, but obviously that's both sides of the energy equation. So you get a direct look into how these patients are manufacturing energy. And if you do this at basal levels, and if you do this under stages of exertion, you can really see how efficiently they can utilize oxygen. The pulmonologists don't know anything about this because they're only using it to diagnose lung and heart disease. So this is a whole new area, using these kinds of measurements to diagnose that not sick zone and try and place people on that not sick zone. From gas exchange analysis, you can get a lot of information that is very germane to anti-aging medicine. Number one, basal metabolic rate, a significant predictable aging marker. 
mitochondrial capacity. You can see how much energy they can burn out when put under an exertion load. This is a significant, predictable aging factor. And based upon these two tests, you can tell them what their physiological age is, I think with quite a bit of confidence. Fat utilization capacity. One of the things that happens as we get older is we can't burn fat as effectively for energy, which is kind of a shame, because that means you're going to get fatter, you're going to start getting fat deposits, you're going to start getting hypoglycemia, you're going to be tired, and your brain's not going to work as well. You can determine how well they're utilizing fat with gas exchange analysis due to the fact that when you burn glucose for energy, there's an extra CO2 molecule that's produced that doesn't occur when you burn fat for energy. Again, metabolic age, I just touched on that. Anxiety disorder, this is, this is a very fascinating area that we're just starting to touch on. And that is the fact that at rest, patients with panic disorder, anxiety types of disorders, have a very unusual pattern on their gas exchange analysis. This is all due because they don't breathe correctly. And I absolutely believe that the cure for most panic and anxiety disorders is teaching patients how to breathe properly, simply that. And of course, you can get an idea of pulmonary function. Pulmonary function, vital capacity, and uh, forced end vital expiratory capacity is a uh, absolute known aging biomarker. So you've got several hugely important pieces of information from this test. I mentioned macular degeneration. I think we need to get much more aggressive on this, and uh, there are some wonderful treatments out now, basically ozone chelation therapy, uh, that will literally reverse macular degeneration. I'm not talking about stopping it, I'm talking about reversing it. The most success we've had is in the people that it's not very bad in. So the earlier we can get this now, I think uh, we want to do this, and um, uh, we work with an optometrist, fortunately located right next door to me, that can do visual fields on all my patients, and I, I really think that somewhere around the age of 60, that's something that you want to do. Digestion. Most of the studies will show you, tell you that oh, something like 20% of people over the age of 60 make no stomach acid. Uh, something like 25% of the patients over the age of 65 have a pancreatic insufficiency. Now, that's very germane because we need to feed them, and we need to feed them good things, and if they can't absorb what we're feeding them, that's a huge problem. This will vary from person to person, so that uh, when we do this Heidelberg capsule test, which is a great test, um, they basically swallow a little capsule, and it goes down, and it's a radio transmitter that's sensitive to pH. And uh, you know, it tells you what the pH is in the stomach, and then you can challenge it with some alkaline loads and see what the uh, reserve of stomach acid is. And it's very fascinating for a couple of reasons. Not only will it tell you if their digestion's off, but in order to make stomach acid, it's very high energy demanding. It demands an extremely high energy level to do that. And um, that's a good tip-off that your patient has got some real energy deficient problems if they're not able to make stomach acid. And it's also kind of neat to see it come back and get normal a year or two down the line. Pancreatic function testing should be done. Uh, we don't do it. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the best test to do is. Uh, it, it appears that the two-day PABA test is the best way to assess pancreatic function. It's a little complex. I haven't gotten around to that. And I'm not sure it's even the best test. But think in terms of good ways to assess pancreatic function. Stool analysis, we've done that in the past. I don't think much of the test, but I put it down here because sometimes it, is, it has helped a little bit. Again, the problem with stool analysis is it's another one of those tests that tells you sick or not sick. It doesn't give you a, a continuum and a non-sick thing to, to, to sense what's optimum and what's not optimum. But you must test digestion. And I mentioned on the digestion issue that uh, you know people over the age of 60, 65 see a, a very high percentage of digestive problems. But I don't mean to imply that people of the age of 35 and 40 don't. You'll also see just a lower percentage, but you will also see patients who are 35 and 40 who don't make stomach acid. Not unusual at all. 
How do you test immune function? This is what we do. This is an evolving thing. Used to do skin testing. Very evolving. How do you test the immune system? At this point, what the lab does is they, they'll take a sample of the uh, NK cells and put them in a Petri dish with tumor cells. And they'll just see how many tumor cells are killed over a unit of time. So how well can your natural killer cells literally kill tumor is what this is going to give you. This is not an NK count. It's a functional assay of your immune system. NK cells are, are pretty much at the end of the line of the way the immune spectrum works. So I, I picked on them to, to be an excellent cross indicator. Not only that, NK cells are extremely sensitive to stress. And what I've learned by doing these is the incredible effect of stress on the immune system. And so this will give you, when you see that NK cell, the NK of variety is low, and you like to see it over 50. Over 50 is optimum. Sometimes their, their report over 20 is optimum, but really over 50 is optimum. 20 is certainly acceptable. As you get down below 20 and certainly below 10, there's a problem. You know, these people are not able to kill tumor cells very well. And leaving that aside, just the fact that their NK cells don't work that well tells you there's all kinds of cytokine imbalance and probably a heck of a lot of stress. So this is, to me, a very good test. But I know that there are other tests that are going to be evolving. So think in terms of how you test immune system function. You don't really know much about immune system function from your history. You know, patients that are getting sick all the time, that doesn't mean their immune system's functioning badly. It might actually mean their immune system's functioning well. So that's not too much of a help. Skin integrity, this would be the best biopsy. Huh? We don't do that. <laughs> But that clearly would be the best way to assess skin integrity. We lose skin moisture, we lose skin thickness as we get older. And this would be an excellent aging marker. Just haven't gotten around to doing that yet. We do a little ultraviolet photography and uh, just show a black light on the patient's face. And uh, that's enough pretty much to motivate them. Another thing you want to think of is, how do I motivate my patient? It's pretty scary when you tell them that they, you just took their NK cells, put them in a test tube with cancer cells, and they didn't kill many of them. That's pretty scary. That's pretty motivating. Okay, what can I do now to make that one better? I got to kill cancer cells. This one's pretty motivating, too. When you hold a black light over their face and they can see all the oxidative damage all over their face, that's pretty motivating as well. Pinch test, uh, you're all probably aware of this one. Again. You hold your hand, palm flat on the table, you pinch it up, you let go. You try that on yourself, you try that on your patients, try that on young ones and old ones, and you'll see that as you get older, the thing is still there five minutes later. <laughs> it's an excellent little test. Some of these tests are easy, and these are the kinds of things that would be done by my trainer in the office. She'll do all this stuff. She spends about an hour with them in there just doing all this stuff. And, and marking it down for me so that when I see them, it's all, it's already done, I don't have to do this. Bone integrity. We do both these tests. We do a, a dense atometry. I'm always quick to point out to my patients it really doesn't mean much to anything when you get one dense atometry. It's just, a, again, it's a statistical range. It's of no importance at all. But to get two of them two years apart, with using the same machine in the same place, which is, you know, is getting to be hard now because everybody's buying a new machine every two years. But, if you can get the same machine and use it consistently and get two dense atometries a couple years apart, then you can have a better idea of what's going on with the bones. Of course, you want to see them maintain their bone density. This is a really neat test because you don't have to wait for two years. There's a number of these factors that are available at laboratories. I like I just picked on entelepeptide because it's what I'm used to using. But when bone is broken down, these factors show up in the urine. So what you'd like to see is very few of them showing up in the urine. And uh, typical numbers would be you might, somebody coming to see you is 50 years old, and they might be showing a number 50. Uh, if you can get that down below 20, that's excellent. That's what you will typically see in a teenager, for example. Uh, I'm sure there'll be other ways to assess this. There are already some other tests that in the urine other than entelopeptide. That's the one I use. It's also a pretty cheap and inexpensive test. Good way to monitor your anabolics is this entelopeptide. If your entelopeptide is high, they're in, in a definite state of catabolic anabolic imbalance. 
A lung function, I uh, mentioned that uh, with the gas exchange analyzer, we get uh, uh, an FEV1 and a VC. A lot of the lung function you will find out is so poor because they're hunched over, they don't breathe properly, uh, they're weak, they don't even know how to take a decent, decent breath, they forgot it. Uh, so these are, can be very motivating. You know, you can get a 60-year-old person in there and say, you know, you're, you have the FVC of a 80-year-old person. That's pretty motivating to get them to do something about that. These functional assays are so helpful because they'll help you to determine when to initiate your therapy. You know, not everybody's going to need all the things that we can do. That allows us to individualize the program, and it also lets us know, is, it, is my therapy working? So that if I get an antelopeptide and it's high, and I initiate therapy, that better be getting low. If it doesn't get low, then apparently what I'm doing isn't working. So these functional analysis are, are invaluable in this specialty. Uh, cardiac function, a very emerging field here. Uh, I think the latest is the electron beam tomography. And this will determine the amount of calcium present in coronary arteries. Uh, that is a, a most definite aging biomarker. Uh, as we get older, the calcium goes out of the bones, it goes into the soft tissues. Ways to measure that is a way to measure the aging process. This is a way that you can technically now, with, with a fair degree of objectivity, measure this. Stress EKGs. I don't really routinely do them because the, the, the incidence of error is so high that they don't really give me a good picture of the patient. However, if they've had an abnormal one, then that's good. So if, they've, if they have a history of coronary artery disease with an abnormal stress test, then you can fix that stress test. That's a good sign. And again, gas exchange analysis will give you, along with an O2 saturation meter, will give you what the cardiac output is. So you can have a sense for that. Cardiac output is also uh, an aging biomarker. So as you can see, as we've gone through this, we've got quite a few very good aging biomarkers that we can look at. So that when I could tell you yesterday that we've stopped the aging process, this is what I mean. These people are no longer functioning as old people. They're functioning as young people. And the uh, O2 SAT monitor, simple little device, and an excellent cross-check on circulation. Do it in about two seconds. Now, that's the measuring of the function. However, there are other factors that affect function that need to be looked at as well. Namely, hormones. Hormones become deficient for the most part as we get older. Nutritional, that's normally a problem because of digestion. The difference between you when you're 55 and you when you're 25 has very little to do with your nutritional status. Because the truth is that when you were 25, you probably ate a whole lot worse than you're eating right now. So the aging doesn't have much to do with that. But it does have to do with digestion and what gets in. Heavy metals, this is pretty much in my mind a huge problem, specifically arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. We see high levels of aluminum. I'm not quite sure what it means. I don't know that anybody knows for sure what that means. Oxidative stress, perhaps one of the most meaningful talks that we heard yesterday was Dr. Inescu's talk about measuring oxidative stress. And if you're going to have an anti-aging clinic, you better have a way to measure oxidant stress. This may be the single most important measurement you need to get. And, and again, I think it's Oxidant stress is directly related to how well the mitochondria is working. If it's working well, there's no, no oxidant stress. If it's not working well, there's oxidant stress. But a direct way to assess oxidant stress could very likely be something that Dr. Inescu is talking about. You get some serum, and you challenge it with an oxidant load, and you see what its buffering capacity for the stress is. What we currently use is another piece of equipment, which I'll mention to you later but need to begin to assess oxidant stress. And then again, I mentioned these two are interrelated. Oxygen utilization is directly related to oxidative stress. One of the main reasons we age is we just flat out get toxic. So when I'm 40 years old, I've got 40 years of toxins. When I'm 80 years old, I've got 80 years of toxins. 
And so what I'd like to do is when I'm 100 years old, have 20 years of toxins. And that's all about elimination. So this is a factor that affects function, needs to be looked at, and of course, lifestyle. These are the hormone levels we look at. I want to mention to you that although we get hormone tests, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to them in terms of whether or not that means to me I'm going to give or not give that patient a hormone. Again, these tests are still based on that statistical range, which in this case means nothing. The lecture about thyroid yesterday pointed that out pretty vividly. But they are nice to have for baseline, and it is nice to know when you give a hormone, what other hormones are being affected? Where's it going? How's it affecting other hormones? Uh, you will find this is very different from person to person. You give one patient pregnenolone, they make progesterone out of it. You give another patient pregnenolone, they make DHEA out of it. You give one patient testosterone, they make estradiol. Another patient testosterone, they make something else. So these tests can give you a, a real concept on, on where your therapy is going. But don't let it determine whether you're going to initiate therapy or not. The best way to determine this is with your history and your physical exam. Because you can diagnose low thyroid states just by looking at them. You can diagnose low testosterone, low estrogen states by talking to the patient, low progesterone, just by talking to them. So that's the best way to go. But you do need to get some tests to establish some baselines. All of our patients uh, get a cortisol measurement, and one of the things I like to hear, by the way, at the uh, panel discussion today is uh, yesterday we heard some discussion about cortisol, high cortisol, and how it destroys the brain and such. In my practice as a physician, I would say for every one high cortisol patient, I get to probably get 10 or 15 low cortisol patients. Uh, we actually give cortisol, the hormone, to quite a few of our patients. So one of my questions would be, um, what are the blood levels of these hormones, of cortisol particularly? What are the blood levels of cortisol that constitute a high level? Or how is that determined? The only ones that I see always with high levels of cortisol are the Alzheimer patients. Other than that, I, this is like one out of every 15 will pop up and surprise me with a high cortisol level. Mostly, they're all low. Melatonin, I found that you need very, very, very little, if any, melatonin, but you need very little. Otherwise, you'll push them right out of the top of the statistical range. I use the free T3 and T4 not to look at the absolute amount of those hormones, not to look at the absolute amount, but to look at the ratio. It's very interesting because that ratio will tell you how well they're converting, T4 to T3. So we look at the ratios there, and some, very often you'll find a very high T4 and a very low T3. It can clue you into what sort of thyroid hormone they should be getting, obviously something with some T3 in it. As Ward was talking about the other day, we need, definitely need to assess this hypothalamic pituitary axis. So it's really important to begin to look at these kinds of markers, and incidentally, although I don't do them anymore because they just were bulky and expensive, looking at challenge tests where you actually give them the releasing hormone and see what levels of ACTH and cortisol are being produced as a result of that. DHEA, IGF-1, unfortunately, we do not have a good way to measure growth hormone status at this time other than a good history and a good physical examination. But the IGF-1, if it's below 150, kind of gets you a little bit more interested in, in seeing what you could do to bring that up to higher levels. Insulin is a huge problem. There's just a great article recently in the Journal of American Medical Association where they actually asked the question, what is an optimal insulin level? Instead of, you know, they run from about 5 to 30. That's the statistical range. So if you have an insulin level of 25, you're normal. Only as it turns out, anything over five, is, there's some objection to that. A linear increase in lipid disorders, uh, cardiovascular disorders, and hypertension as the insulin level starts getting above five. So we like to see a below five insulin level. This is a huge cross check on almost, on their exercise, their stress, their diet, their anabolics, their mitochondria, that fasting insulin is a 
is a huge check. If you can get that thing below five, you've really done your patient some good service. And then we obviously look at a PSA, look at a dihydrotestosterone. It's really important to look at estrogens in men. Very important. Because when you're giving them testosterone, a lot of men are going to turn it right into estrogen. And in men, estrogen is a poison. It's an absolute poison. So we need to watch that. Because if you're giving them testosterone and they're turning it into estradiol, you better be giving them dihydrotestosterone. And that won't turn into estradiol. And I measure progesterone just to measure it. I'm not quite sure why other than just to learn more about it. And then women, of course, the, the female hormones. So these are the, the standards that we use. Uh, I have drifted towards saliva. I have used them all. I've used blood. I've used urine. I've used saliva. The saliva testing is getting really good. It's getting really inexpensive. It's easy to do at a distance. You just send them a kit, and they can live in another town, spit into the tube, mail it into the lab. You get a lot of stuff done on saliva, and you're going to see this technology probably taking over everything, I would say, pretty soon. Uh, you can also do blood, and you can also do urine. In terms of nutrition, uh, discuss the issue of insulin. As we get older, we cannot utilize fat as well for energy. Uh, this is uh, a cause of high insulin levels and is a result of high insulin levels. So uh, our dietary intake of carbohydrates need to, needs to decrease. Like I tell my patients, carbohydrates are for kids. Remember the old tricks are for kids commercial? Carbohydrates are for kids because kids are in this expansive growth thing and they need all that gasoline. But for us, we're just maintaining. We don't need to grow. And for us, carbohydrates are, are something we want to cut back on. And these values in here give you a pretty good idea. Actually, in the, again, the gas exchange analysis gives you a pretty good idea of what's going on with that carbohydrate axis and how well they're doing with their energy. Body composition, I think, is just the body water. Dr. Nagy yesterday was talking about perhaps the reason we age is because we lose body water. We lose intracellular water. There's no doubt that that happens. This is a very easy way to measure it. You get a body composition, we look, use an impedance monitor. And it will measure the uh, amount of water that you have in your tissues. Pretty simple little device but a very good aging marker and a very good way to follow your patients because you definitely want to see that impedance come down as you're initiating your therapies. We do a diet history, not, not a huge one, just mostly, I'm mostly interested about junk. I mean, my diet is basically eat good food, number one. Don't eat any junk, just eat good food, natural stuff that wasn't man-made. Just eat good food. Number two, don't eat much of it. Eat very little. The fewer calories you take in, the longer you will live. That's proven. We all know this. And number three, eat very few carbohydrates. And number four, get a lot of fiber. As long as you do that, I don't really care how much fat you eat, how much protein you eat so much, but if you'll follow those simple rules, that's what I'm interested in. If they're vegetarian, this is always going to be a problem. A, a strict vegan is not doing the right thing and they're going to have difficulties, and they're going to need some help. So you definitely want to uh, isolate uh, people that are vegans and uh, talk to them a little bit more. Uh, simple carbs, discuss that. Fiber, need a lot of fiber. The processed fats are perhaps the biggest mess out there. And of course, alcohol, coffee. Little alcohol is very good. Little coffee is very good. More than a little isn't. About getting a balance there. And all these ridiculous uh, low-fat, non-fat, all that stuff's got to go. Heavy metals, huge problem. I've underestimated this for years until I, until I started doing challenge tests routinely. No way for me to assess this with a history or physical exam, really. On the gas exchange analysis, their mitochondria flat out don't work. So that gives me kind of a clue. So in everybody over the age of 65, we now do an EDTA challenge give them a dose of EDTA, and we do a 24-hour urine for these minerals. And uh, we give them a DMPS, I think it's a 250 milligram tablet, and collect the urine two hours later for mercury. You'd be surprised how many people are absolutely loaded with mercury. And just because they've had their dental amalgams exchanged out doesn't mean they're not loaded with mercury. It's all over the environment. 
Obviously, it'd be nice if they stopped smoking. We want to know what their job is if they work in a body shop and in, or printer shop and inhale all kinds of toxic fumes. We want to make sure that if they live in a climate like I live in, it's a very high climate. Uh, it's extremely dry. Uh, you get very dehydrated. You better be drinking two quarts of water. It's kind of interesting since I've been in France now for a, a week, I can't drink that much water. <laughs> Because it doesn't, it doesn't evaporate, I just go to the bathroom every, every you know, 30 minutes. So I've cut down my water intake. But in my climate, in the high, dry desert, it's uh, incredibly important to drink a ton of water. This is a huge problem. Many of my patients come in, they're seeing a cardiologist who's got them on one of those god-awful lipid-lowering drugs, or a beta blocker. This is a big problem, how are you going to deal with that? Normally, my cardiologist doesn't care his ego gets a little ruffled, but he doesn't care is if the cholesterol is okay if I take them off the drug, as long as the cholesterol gets okay. So we need to have sort of natural ways and alternatives to medications. A major part of why our patients age is because of the drugs we give them. The worst ones are the ones they take all their life, obviously. The hypertensive drugs, the NSAIDs, the beta blockers, the lipid-lowering drugs are just a crisis. Antibiotics significantly impair the immune system. It takes a while to recover your immune system functionally after a dose of antibiotics. So if you can find ways of getting around antibiotics, that'd be great. Steroids, obviously, a problem. The beta blockers and the calcium channel blockers are a huge problem in my mind. And antacids is a huge problem. I've got a whole lecture on uh, the way antacids interfere with mitochondrial function. Oxidant stress, very important, I think, to find ways to measure the iron and copper levels. We just do serum, just to see. Every now and then, pick up a high iron. Every now and then, pick up a high copper. Not too much on the copper, but we watch it anyway. And we like to see it fall anyway, whatever the level is. I like to see the iron and the copper levels get in the very low end of that statistical range. These induce free radical damages, you know. Oxidation markers, this whole area, this oxidative stress is a huge area that we have to pay attention to. We have to have ways to measure and uh, certainly to treat this. Uh, you know, one thing I, I use this whole blood redox potential, and I use a piece of equipment that's called a BEV. It's an old German piece of equipment. It's not very accurate in many ways, but it can measure me whole redox blood potential. I've done this for years and years, so I get a little bit of a feeling for it. But th this is definitely something that we need to look at. I don't know how many of you uh, routinely look at your patient's blood, but that's a routine with me. They sit down in the chair, I throw their blood on the microscope, I look at it all the time virtually, unless they come up with a sprained ankle maybe. Other than that, I'm looking at their blood all the time. If that blood looks perfect, and what perfect means is another lecture, but if that blood looks perfect, that patient has very little oxidant stress. It doesn't look perfect a whole lot, okay? But if it looks perfect, you know, it gives you a very nice, quick, easy, albeit qualitative way to assess how your patient's doing right then and there. Oxygen utilization, I've already mentioned, I think this is hugely important, and I do the gas exchange analysis to determine this. This is a simple test, a venous pH. You basically put a tourniquet on, put the needle into the antecubital vein, deflate the tourniquet, wait about 30 seconds, then draw off a tube of blood and do a pH on the whole blood. As we age, that pH goes up. It gets higher. You want to see the pH come down. Now, stop and think about it for a second. If the pH of the artery, which is pretty well controlled around 7.4, the pH of the artery is 7.4, the pH of the blood ought to be less than that. If it's not less than that, you've got a problem. I mean, your myocardia aren't working, because it should be making it less than that. And you will see, very few of your patients will have a venous pH less than 7.4. This is not going to happen. There's a whole lot of reasons for this. But this is a cheap, easy way to assess the overall aging process that you can do right now, right in your office, very soon. AV blood gases, I've done these in the past. Uh, you just simultaneously draw an arterial blood gas and a venous blood gas and see what the difference is, and that'll tell you what your oxygen utilization is. Don't do that anymore because I've got the gas exchange analyzer and who wants to stick arteries routinely. But that wasn't an excellent test, and it is a good way to assess. 
oxygen utilization, which is perhaps the most important thing that we can assess in aging. In terms of elimination, dark field examination of blood. If they're not eliminating, that blood looks toxic and it looks lousy. Another good quick cross check. Uh, I see my patient, put him on a detoxification program, bring him back, look at the blood. It should look better. It's not going to look good, but it should look better. Very quick way. Blood resistivity, urine pH, urine resistivity are all measurements done on an instrument called the BL9000. I brought some information on that particular instrument. It's one that we use an awful lot. It uh, gives a ton of information, and it's one that you can use right in the office. What I like about this new device that I'm currently using is it's all automatic. You take the patient's urine, you take the patient's saliva, take a blood specimen, plug it in the machine, push a button, walk away, you come back, the measurements are all taken, all nine measurements are taken, the machine is cleaned out, it's recalibrated and ready for the next specimen. Very cool and very neat to do in your office. The blood resistivity will go down as the patient becomes more toxic. The urine pH will go down as the patient gets more acidic. The uh, urine resistivity will also give you a good idea of how the balance is when you compare it to the blood resistivity. Obviously, it wants to be higher. And then, of course, urine analysis, BUN and creatinine, give you a little bit of an idea. These, unfortunately, are sick, not sick tests, but you get a little bit of a better idea with that BUN, particularly if it's high, you want to get it lower, lower is better. And of course, your liver enzymes and various metabolites now of the Krebs cycle are available by urine. So these are some things to consider in terms of following your elimination program. You want to make sure that kidney, lymphatics, and liver are working well at optimal. Our intestinal dysbiosis, perhaps the biggest source of toxicity in the human body is the intestines. Uh, this occurs as a result of an imbalance in the bacteria. There are certain urine markers, like a urine indicant test we do routinely in all our patients. It's so easy to do, and it's cheap, and uh, it's not, you know, great. If it's off, it's helpful. You can do a stool culture. This is where the one case where I find the stool analysis kind of helpful. In a stool culture, sometimes you'll find some just bizarre examples of dysbiosis. So that's a very nice test to do. Nucleic acid damage, somebody asked the other day about telomerase, other tests. These are not tests that we do. I have no good way of assessing the DNA damage at this time. But this is something we need to think about, because very clearly, that's an extremely important aging marker. Look at DNA damage. Again, we don't want our patients to get sick and die before we've had a chance of our anti-aging program to work on them. So. We need to do some uh, tests to make sure that they don't have any cardiovascular disease if they do, and then treat that. But we need to identify this before it happens. This is an extremely quick, fast evolving field. This slide will be no good in six months, I'm sure. Uh, but these are the kinds of tests we now do. I like to see uh, that they don't have any calcium in the coronary arteries. If they do, I'd like to get rid of it. I uh, like to look at the uh, clotting factor of their blood. One of the neatest things about that dark field test is you'll literally see clots in the blood in there, maybe a third of your patients. They'll come in, there'll be clots in the blood. You're looking at it. And what I was just talking with the doctors the other day is some of these patients are on aspirin. So aspirin clearly does not stop clotting blood. Other things are involved, normally hormones. But this is a very nice little test to, to find out clotting blood. But of course, the fibrinogen, the lipo-A's, lipo-B's, the ratios, C-reactive proteins, all of these kinds of values are important to look at and treat. They're off. Osteoporosis, we talked a little bit about. Just get the patient's height. Ask them how tall they are and then measure their height. It won't be the same. That will give a pretty good indication right there. The genetics, what's the family history like? Alzheimer's, there's a couple of tests out now for Alzheimer's disease. I don't know how good they are, so I don't do them. But I'm sure you will see some more evolving there. Alzheimer's is a disease I think we can beat if we get it early enough. Same with Parkinson's. I start pretty much everybody on Depernil, so I'm not probably going to ever see this problem in my patients. But clearly, any kind of equilibrium, any kind of tremor, I want to get very aggressive with that. Cancer, I don't like mammograms. We do a thermogram, and I'm sure there's going to be better ways now to perhaps begin to assess when cancer is a potential likelihood with our patient. Diabetes, I've, the hemoglobin A1C test will pick up diabetes a lot faster than almost any other test will. 
So we do these at the age of 40, and then we repeat them every five years, whether or not there's a family history of diabetes. A two-hour glucose tolerance test is a little bit more sensitive. However, it's not practical to do on a regular basis. And then we mentioned macular degeneration, screening early for that so that you can treat early. These are just diseases that we get as we get older. It's got nothing to do with aging. This is just getting sick. So we need to stop from getting sick in order to live longer so we can have an effective anti-aging program. Okay, so this is what happened. We think baseline. So we want to do this, all this stuff on your patients when they're young and then perhaps repeat it every five years. As you repeat it, you'll find things are going wrong. As they go wrong, you fix them. A very evolving field. But this is all the stuff we do. On the over 60 crowd, we do a few other things because these are fairly meaningless to do at a younger level. They're going to be pretty much optimal up until this particular time of life. In terms of what we use in the clinic, uh, the BL2000 is something I just mentioned to you. It does urine pH, blood resistivity, blood redox, and a lot of other things, and I'm quite not sure what the value is to them. But it does some very important tests. Urine indican, I mentioned, for the dysbiosis. We do a urine analysis. We do a thermography in the clinic, do a body composition. This is really easy to do. The gas exchange analysis, of course, gives us all that uh, metabolic information and then these lung function studies. This is all stuff we do in the clinic. Everything else is sent out. The trainer basically does these kinds of assays. On the Think Fast, if you do end up getting that program, we use number one, three, and five. There's seven things in there. We use one, three, and five. The balance tests, my trainer goes over exercise and stretching. And just some last minute considerations. I talked about the important value of patient education. Really important. You might even have a website where they can like go to your website and just learn everything they need to know about what you're doing. Because they need to know what you're doing, why you're doing it. Vitamin mineral testing, uh, I don't do that anymore. I used to do tons of it. I don't do it anymore. I found it's essentially useless the great majority of the time. However, a vitamin C level can be really helpful because every now and then you're going to find somebody that just for some reason has no vitamin C in their blood. And vitamin E is another one. So those two we will assay. In terms of minerals, I never found anybody that wasn't deficient in chromium, so I just assume they're deficient in chromium. And then I test them down the line after I'm giving them chromium. And the other two minerals that you'll routinely see is uh, magnesium and zinc. Other than that, for some reason, they can be drinking Cokes and eating Twinkies and have normal everything else. Periodic monitoring is a, a normal in-house testing. We talked about that. Special personnel. Uh, you will need, of course, the trainer to do all these tests and personnel to do these tests. And you will also need to administer IV therapies, intravenous ozone peroxide therapies, and chelation therapies, intravenous vitamin and mineral therapies are all something you'll need. So you'll need to have a setup for IV therapy and a nurse geared to do IV therapy. Last word about marketing. This is really interesting. When I first got into this field, like I said, the first thing was I thought everybody would be so excited about this. I found out most people don't really want to live that long anyway. So that was the first thing I learned. Second thing I learned was that um, the men are really interested in this. So I think if you're, uh, uh, men are a little bit shy about it, but we're really interested in this. So that when you establish your marketing program and you're going out to talk to you, what you know, you want to talk to men between the ages of 50 and 65. Women are pretty hip to it, and they're going to, you're going to get them anyway because they go through menopause. But that 50 to 65 group, it seems like once they get over 65, they don't care too much anymore. Either that or they don't believe this or whatever. But that's what I would uh, have you focus your attention on. Well, thanks for your attention.